Hello, it's it's Robert here. Robert, yeah. Rob, hi, Robert. My name's Linton. Nathan, is it? No, Linton. Linton. Hello, hello Linton. Yes, L I N T O N. Linton. Ho hello, Linton. Yes. Hi. Thank hello, you. you. Uh, thank thank you for letting me call you. I do appreciate it. Um, I'm puzzled about the hundred and forty-four thousand and a couple of passages right. in the Book of Revelation. That's what's giving me a bit of trouble. Okay. And you mentioned um, the Enjoy Life um, brochure you've looked at. Yes, yes. Did someone put, give it to you over the weekend or recently, or did you find it on the web? Um, it was on the website. It was down downloadable on the website. Oh, all right, okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. I understand that you teach that there's two classes of believer the anointed the 144,000 go to heaven but they're they're no longer human they're changed into non-human spirit creatures have i got that right yes 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 and then the great crowd live on the earth that's right yes the yes. great crowd have no covenant but the anointed have two covenants. They have the covenant for the kingdom and the new covenant. And have I got that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if the anointed are in heaven and you say they're no longer human, they've been changed into non-human spirit creatures? Mm -hmm. Revelation 21 verse 3 talks about God dwelling with men. Right. Um I'll read from verse 1 to verse 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, that means the dwelling of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Right. So it says twice, well, it actually says three times that God is going to be with men. He's yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. with men, he's going to dwell with them, and God himself will be with them, meaning men. Now, mm -hmm. as the spirit creatures are no longer human, would you believe that God is going to dwell on earth? Because that's where the men are in the Jehovah's Witness belief that I've read. You teach them... Men will be resurrected to the earth, but the ones who will be recreated in the heavens will be non-human spirit creatures. So if God's going to dwell with men, surely it must be on the earth. Yeah. Um, well, God, no, God won't be on the earth. Um, yeah, maybe, I, I probably need to come back to you on that one. But it's... Sorry. Yeah, he won't be with them. He won't be with them on the earth. Yeah, yeah, but um. But it, well, how does Revelation twenty one three read in the New World Translation? Could you could you just read it? Yeah, let me um, let me mm. find it. Thank you, thank you, Linton. Okay. Right. It says, "With that, I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look." The tent of God is with mankind, and he will reside with them, and they will be his people, right. and God himself will be with them. So it talks about a tent, it? it says the tent of God will be with mankind. Yes. I mean, in the, in the Bible, the, the tent is used to represent um, like God's, God's protection or security. So it's not literally saying that he's going to be with mankind, but he's going to protect mankind where does it say that in verse three let me read it again in mind and i heard a use the word protect i mean it talks about the ten i mean so there's quite a different revelation is quite a deep book actually some of it some of it's literal some of it's symbolic it's a matter of trying to yes the um, the decide from what is when when is what Yes. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was the dwelling place of God. It was where the Shekinah glory was and the Holy of Holies. So when it says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, it's talking about the, the dwelling of God. It's referring to the Shekinah glory in the, the tent of meeting that they, they carried through the desert for, for 40 years. It says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. 
right? So God is with men, and he will dwell with them. So there's the right. word dwell, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be right. their God. So three times it says God is going to dwell with men. Yeah. But according to Jehovah's yeah, yeah. Witness teaching that I've yeah, read... Say that, um, you it also says that God is a spirit as well. So, um, and that, you know, no man can see God. He's not going to be, he's not going to physically, physically be on the earth. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm just observing your literature. Your oh, literature no. says that the ones in heaven, the angels aren't human these mm -hmm. the uh, anointed hundred and forty four thousand will be changed into non-human spirit creatures so they That's won't true. be human yes right and it says here god is going to dwell with men we're the only men during the millennium if you believe in that um is is going to be here on the earth that's that's where the men are going to be resurrected to. They're not going to be resurrected to heaven. They're going to be resurrected to the earth. And it says, yeah. behold, the tabernacle of God, that means the dwelling of God is with men. Right. So God's yeah. going to be with men and he will dwell with them. Secondly, it's reemphasized it. He's going to dwell with them. Well, how can God dwell with men if they're on the earth and he's in heaven and they right. shall be his people and God himself will be with them? So there's yeah. the third emphasis and be their God. So it's triple emphasis that God is going to be with men. Well, mm -hmm. if there's no men in heaven, if the men are only on the earth, then surely God must be on the earth. Yeah. But then again, there are other verses in the Bible that say that God is a spirit and God does not dwell. You know, God does not dwell on the earth because he's a spirit. Where so does I think, it say, I think it's the, where, where does it look? God is a spirit. Is John four twenty four? I, I I read that in the insight in um, in the Enjoy Life Forever book. Um, right. Chapter seven talks about right. that. Um, right. So I read that there, and I would agree with that. I'm not a right. Jehovah's Witness. I'm not here to defend your belief. I'm just trying to look impartially at your belief. Okay. And. It does say God it, three times. It says God is going to be with men. Well, if there's no men in heaven, and that's mm -hmm. what you teach, how can God be in heaven if there's no men in heaven? The men are going to be on the earth. Uh, can, can you see? I'm not. I'm not trying to be difficult, but can you see my 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 yeah, yeah, concern? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it says it says the tent of God is with mankind. It doesn't say with men, just with mankind. Uh, I mean, it, it says ten, it says it three what? times. The first yeah. statement is, "Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men." That's the first statement. Tabernacle refers to the Shekinah glory of the tent of meeting in the Old Testament, that called that called the tabernacle. Okay, where the Shekinah glory was the presence of God. So it's talking about God's dwelling with men. Then it says, uh -huh. and the second statement is, "And he he will dwell with them." Well, God can't dwell with them if he's in heaven and they're on the earth. Yeah, I agree and, with that. I agree with that one. Agree and, with that. and the third statement is, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and shall be their yeah. God. Well, how can God be with them if he's in heaven and they're on the earth? Yeah, I understand. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. He's, not, he's not literally with them, um, but he's, he's going to, he'll protect his people. I mean, there's some things in the Bible to be taken literally, literally. And there are some things in the Bible that cannot be taken literally. And I think this is one of those expressions where it's not to be taken literally. So when it says three times, the tabernacle of God is with men, God's not with men. And when it says he's with men, it really means he's not with men. And when it says, oh, secondly, he yeah. will dwell with them, it means he's not going to dwell with them. That's the real meaning. And when it says they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The real meaning of that, he's not going to be with them and he's not going to be their God. No, no, no. He'll yeah. be with them, but not literally on earth as a person. Because the other verses in the Bible tells us that God is a spirit and God does not live on earth. He's the creator of the earth. So he doesn't live on the earth. Um, he lives in the heavens, so he won't, he won't literally be on the earth. But he, he can be with them in the sense that he's... He, he gives them their attention, he's providing protection. Yeah, because a, a literal tent would provide protection for people. So God is going to protect um, his faithful servants. 
but it doesn't mean that he's literally with them on the earth. Where are the men? In the millennium and after the millennium, where are men going to live? Well, the Bible talks about people living on earth forever. Right. It talks about two classes of people. Um, we don't decide who goes to heaven or who lives on the earth. That's Jehovah God decides that. But some people will yes. enjoy life in heaven. Yes. Some people enjoy life on the earth. So if, if the men are on the earth... He'll be with them in the sense that he'll protect them, care for them, but it doesn't mean that he's literally physically with them. How would the Bible have to read to say he's going to be literally with them? I mean, how would the Bible have to read to convince you? Well, well sometimes you have to look at other verses in the Bible. Um, and then you, get the, you have to look at the context as well. And, you know, I mean, one verse would say one thing, but you have to look at another verse yeah. to get the proper understanding. Yeah, I mean, it says he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Yeah. When it says he will dwell with them, doesn't it mean, doesn't the real meaning that God is going to be with his people, with these men? I see where you're coming from, but, um, you know, if you look at other verses in the Bible, it tells us that God cannot be on the earth. God will not be on the earth. Where does it, where, so, which verse says, says, says that? I certainly believe that God the Father is not on the earth, but I believe that the Son of God is on yeah. the earth. I believe Jesus Christ is on the earth and he is the one who is the head of the kingdom, the kingdom uh -huh. he's going to hand over to the Father in 1 Corinthians 15, 28. He's a part of that kingdom because he's a human being himself. And as, as the head of the this kingdom, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 says he's going to hand this kingdom over to the Father. OK, uh -huh. can I ask another question? There's another question that puzzled me. The great, the great crowd, is it in yes. heaven or is it on the earth? Um, Revelation 7 talks about a great crowd that come out of the Great Tribulation and they will live on the earth. And the great crowd will, will be on the earth. Right. Could you read Revelation 19 verse 1, please? Because that, that puzzled me in the New World Translation. Thank you. Um, after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great crowd in heaven. They said, praise Jah, the salvation and the glory and the power belong to our God. So, Linton, um, it says the great crowd is in heaven. Mm -hmm. so, so I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great crowd in heaven. He didn't say the great crowd are actually in heaven. He says, after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great crowd. So he's not saying the great crowd was in, in heaven itself. He's saying, I, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice. Seemed to be? Is, is that how your so word translation saying, reads? So it's not saying it literally. He's it not literally saying that there's a great crowd in heaven. My Bible says, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power to the Lord our God. So a great multitude in heaven, your Bible says a great crowd in heaven. But, it, but then it says, um, there's, a word, there's a word missing from, from the King James Bible. It says, after this I heard what seemed to be a loud voice. Whereas what you just read to me said, I heard what was a loud voice. So that word makes a bit of difference. How does it change the context? Are you saying that there's no great crowd at all? No, we're saying there's not a great crowd in heaven because the Bible says the great crowd um, will live on the earth. But it so says... It says... It says, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Yeah, but this one says, I... I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great crowd. Okay. So not saying there was a great, so the, the, the okay, so whether there seems to be a loud voice or not, where is the location of the great crowd? Is it heaven or earth? The great crowd will live on the earth. How do you explain the fact it says in Revelation 19.1, the great crowd in heaven? It doesn't say that. It just says I heard what was a loud voice. I heard... What seemed to be a loud voice of a great crowd in heaven. So he's not saying there literally was a great crowd in heaven. No, he, but, um, he, he, he says there seemed to be a loud voice. 
Yes. But the loud voice well, comes from the great crowd, yes? Would the would the loud voice come from the great crowd? It's after this I heard what seemed to be a loud voice. Yes, but the, the, the loud they voice have, comes from the great job. crowd. The loud voice comes from the great crowd. They're singing praise, hallelujah, salvation, glory and honour and power to the Lord our God. So the seeming, he seems to hear this loud voice, all right, of a great crowd singing their praises. I'm just asking, where does the Bible say the great crowd is? Right, give me a second. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Revelation 7 talks about a great crowd standing before the throne. It doesn't literally mean that they're in heaven. Where is um, the, where is the yeah, throne of God? Sorry? You should, you should give the verse. It's Revelation 7, 9 you're quoting, isn't it? Well, you're not, not quoting it, you're paraphrasing it. Revelation 7, 9? Yes, yes. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude. I think your Bible says, does it say great crowd? It says a great crowd, yes. Which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. They're before the throne, yes? Yes. Where is the throne of God? Well, the throne of God is in heaven, but you can... You can be standing before the throne, but it doesn't, doesn't literally mean that you're, you're in heaven. Don't you? I will. I would agree. The throne of God is in heaven. That's Revelation chapter four, verse two. Don't you think that sounds a little weak? I mean, the Bible says they're standing before the throne. The throne's in heaven. So surely the Bible is indicating the location of this great, great, great crowd is in heaven. Yeah, but that wouldn't be compatible with other parts of the Bible where it talks about. Um where he talks about the, the great crowd living on earth forever, so that, you know... The great crowd what? No, I said that wouldn't be compatible with the message invading other parts of the Bible where he talks about the great crowd living on the earth, mm -hmm. enjoying life on the earth forever. Well, I, I do believe the great crowd... Revelation, Revelation is not straightforward. It's, you know, part of Revelation is symbolic, part of it is literal, it's... it's um, We'd have to cross-reference with other verses to get the complete picture. Hmm. So you can't just pick out one verse and say, this is that, yeah. and that says that. You have to look at, you know, other yeah. verses in, in other chapters to get the, the overall yeah. understanding. Of it. I could pick out one verse and say, this is that. It doesn't, that's not necessarily, not necessarily accurate interpretation. So you have to read, you know, the overall message to get the, the full picture. Don't you think that other groups like the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventist and extreme Pentecostal groups and the Catholics do exactly the same thing? They pick and choose their Bible verses to, to back up what they've already decided the Bible ought to say. So they don't look at the whole Bible, they just pick and choose Bible verses to agree with what they've decided the Bible should say. Yeah, but that would be wrong. Um, that, that, would, that would be wrong, because uh, in... in, in in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, it talks about the Bereans, and it says they carefully examined these things to see whether they were so. So we can't just pick out one verse. Okay. We can't just pick out one verse to, to fit what we want it to, to fit, how we want it to fit, so to speak. Yes. We have to get the overall picture and then, you know, then, then come to hopefully to an accurate conclusion of what it is. The, the 144,000 of Revelation 7, 4, I would see this as just picturing the church because I, I believe that God has just one people of God. Right. Um, it says in Revelation 7, 4, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Is this literal or is this figurative, spiritual? Well, it does talk about 144,000, yeah, out of all tribes. In other words, it's made up of people of all different nations, tribes. You know, if you go back in history, the Israelites mm -hmm. at one time were God's chosen people. 
But then the Israelites, you know, they often rebelled. God forgave them, they rebelled, forgave them. And it got to the point where God abandoned the literal Israelites because they were so rebellious. And then he gave his blessing to people of all nations and tribes and tongues. So, you know, we believe that the 144,000 is made up of people from all nations, all tribes, all tongues. Yeah. Is, is Revelation 7 4? We don't choose who becomes 144. Jehovah God is the one who decides who will. Is, will make up the 144,000. Is, is Revelation 7 4, Linton, literal or spiritual? 7 4. Yeah. Do you want to read it in your New World Translation? It says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, and sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. Yeah, out of the tribe of Judah, 12,000, and it goes on yeah. So when it says 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed, is that literal or is that spiritual, figurative? Spiritual Israel. No, is that statement a literal statement or is that just spiritual? It's, um, it's spiritual. Okay, well, I would, ag I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, yeah. I, I think agree. This, this whole passage is spiritual. Yes. And the, because it says all the tribes of the children of Israel, it can't be literal. Because when you go to the tribes in the next four verses, there's no tribe of Dan, there's no yeah, tribe of Ephraim, yeah, yeah. and it mentions yeah, yeah. the tribe of Joseph, which is a tribe which doesn't even exist. So That's the right. reason for it rendering this way is that God is making a very strong statement that this is picturing the church. It's not to be taken to be literal Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would agree with that. We'd agree with that. Well, if this is spiritual, for instance, of, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Is that literal or is that spiritual? That's spiritual. The whole, the whole thing, because, um, I mean, the tribe of Judah, Revelation had its fulfilment, you know, in, we believe the Revelation time is fulfilment now. I mean, the tribe of Judah is long gone. The tribe of Ruby is long gone. They, they died a long time ago. So when it says the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed in Revelation 7, 5, is that literal or is that spiritual? That's spiritual. Right. So therefore, the number 12,000 is spiritual because the tribe of Judah is spiritual. And you can go through all the other tribes, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, each of which mentions 12,000 were sealed. It's all spiritual. Yes, yes. Right. So if the number 12,000 is spiritual... And it's mentioned 12 times. 12 times 12,000 is 144,000. That number is spiritual. It just pictures the church. The great crowd is the 144,000. Just different ways of referring to the body of Christ. The, the number 144,000 yeah. is simply yeah. the number of um, perfection. Sorry, completion. And the number of perfection in government squared and cubed. So, you know, you have the Ten Commandments, okay, so that's the number of perfection. You times it by itself, ten times, you know, you cube it, ten times ten times ten, that's a thousand. And then the number for government is twelve. So you have twelve apostles. So you, 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 um, you times that by itself, twelve twelves, 144. Then you multiply those two numbers, a thousand and... 144 together and you get 144,000 it's all spiritual it's not supposed to be taken literally and John looks and sees the 144,000 and then this 144,000 is is the great multitude of verse 9 there aren't two different peoples of God the idea that there's two different peoples of God comes from a belief known as dispensationalism um, it's uh, tiny in Europe. It never really caught on in a big way in Europe, but it caught on massively in America. And for the last 130 years, dispensationalism has dominated American evangelicalism. Um, there's conspiracy theories as to why that's so. Um, lots of Jewish people, 
moved from Russia to America and became very rich and took over the media and the cinema and banking. And it's very likely that they're the ones who've influenced American evangelical Christianity to adopt firstly dispensational theology. And then, you know, it is a conspiracy theory. I can't prove this, but it's likely that they're the ones who, you know, 40 odd years ago when the TV ministry started, they're the ones who um, helped to start up the TV ministries, pushing the evangelical church in the direction of Pentecostalism, which over the last 40 years has become more and more and more hard, 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 hardcore. Actually, Christian TV started about 50, just over 50 years ago. Um, but I mean, I've noticed in Jehovah's Witness um, literature, for instance, yeah. the Watchtower for the 1st of February 1991, page 29, I was looking at this yesterday. Um, it mentions Bullinger. Uh, it says, it is interesting that E.W. Bullinger wrote on 2 Peter 1.19. Okay, so it mentions Bullinger. Well, he was a hyper-dispensationalist. All right, so Schofield was bad. John Nelson Darby was bad, but Bullinger is far worse. He's a hyper dispensationalist. And that is, you take the Bible with such crass literalism that you see the church as an afterthought. It's, it's summed up by the mnemonic laser, L A Z E R. L for literal, you take the Bible literally. A, the church is an afterthought. Z in, in laser, seven dispensations, seven different ways of getting saved in different dispensations. Though I should add, since so, so what, what? So what's what? What's motivated you to look on the website in the first place? Well, I I just want to obey Jehovah God and do the will of Jehovah God. I don't attend any, any any church. If I could just finish, um, the idea that there's seven dispensations, seven different ways of getting saved in seven dispensations. Not all dispensationists believe that. Um, mm -hmm. Since the mid '60s, thank goodness. In America and worldwide, there's been a new type of dispensationalism, which is far more moderate, which doesn't teach that heresy, um, which is the worst aspect of dispensational theology. Um, so that's a, a good development. Um, uh, the next part of laser, ER, E stands for earthly hope for the Jews, because the Jews are going to live on the earth eternally in dispensationalism. And then um, R for rapture. All people who are, who believe in the rapture are dis are dis dis are dispensationalists, and the rapture takes the church up to heaven. So the church lives in heaven for eternally, the Jews live on the earth eternally, and never the twain shall meet. And it's my very strong opinion that the Watchtower literature mentions Bullinger. There was another um, Watchtower I was looking at. I think it was 1999 Watchtower um, that also mentions Bullinger. Yeah. yeah, 1999 Watchtower, 1st of December, page 11. It mentions uh, Bullinger. And there's another Watchtower, and I can't remember where that is. Uh, I'd have to hunt around to find it. It mentions a professor of New Testament at Dallas Theological Seminary right. in support of Watchtower doctrine. Now... Dallas Theological, Center, Dallas Theological Seminary is the mecca for dispensationalism in America. It's, it's, it's the center, okay? It's the Vatican of dispensationalism. And um, the professor is now dead. I forget the professor's name, but that's, that's mentioned in another Watchtower article. Um, so I think that the Watchtower has been greatly influenced by dispensational theology. Um, that's one of my opinions. When Rutherford found out the number of Jehovah's Witnesses exceeded 144,000, what's he going to do when he's teaching that only 144,000 go to heaven and he's got 200,000 Jehovah's Witnesses or 250,000, 300,000? So he came up with this two, two class idea. You've got two classes of believer. The anointed are in the new covenant and have a, an extra covenant for the kingdom. They'll go to heaven. The great crowd will live on the earth. They have no covenant at all. Christ is not their mediator. It says that in worldwide security under the Prince of Peace. Christ is not the mediator for the great crowd. 
He's only the mediator for the anointed. Um, where did he get this from? It didn't come out of thin air. American dispensationalism has dominated American evangelicalism for 130 years. Totally dominated it. It is declining and it is moderating, which is a good sign since about the mid 60s. It's very slowly moderating and it's very slowly declining in its influence, but it's still the most powerful. Um, it's still the most powerful group in American evangelicalism. Um, and it's why there's so many people supporting Donald Trump, because they have a dispensational view about Israel. Because remember, the second point of dispensation, L-A-Z-E-R, A, is the church as an afterthought. Why is the church an afterthought? Because Christ came to save the Jews. He's not interested in Gentiles. Everything's focused on the Jews and Israel. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I've, you know, I've found this, that Rutherford, obviously, in the 1930s, when he came up with this doctrine in 1935, all he had to do was look around, and everywhere he looked, he would have seen American evangelicals teaching something similar. <coughs> and he just adapted it, in, in my opinion. That's, that's the way that I would see it. Um, I, are you aware, regarding the millennium, this is rather old. Um, I don't know which month this is. I know, I know it's, um, it's a golden age from 1930. It's page 446. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a um, sore throat. I ate my dinner quite quickly so I can speak to you. Um, okay. So it's page 446. It's the golden age for 1930 in the bound volumes. I've got a scan of it. Uh, it says, will husband and wife live together after the resurrection is completed, if both are, are in harmony with God? And the answer is, the scriptures do not reveal the, relation, well, the relationship of men and women will be after the resurrection is completed. The most that we know is that there will be no children born during the last hundred years of the millennium, nor any born after that, because men and women will not have children after they reach the age of 100 years. Whether the identity of the sexes as such will be preserved, we do not know. There have been some well-authenticated instances in which women have been transformed into men. Right? So you got all this transsexual stuff today and gender identity. This is in the Golden Age, which is the name of the early, early version of Awake. There have been some well-authenticated instances in which women have been transformed into men. And it is possible that this transformation may become general and we shall all be brothers together. So when it gets to 900 years in the millennium, men will go to bed with their wives in a double bed. And when the man wakes up, he'll say, how are you, darling? And his wife will be transformed in, into a man. It was, oh, I'm all right, thank you. And, you know, the women will be transformed into men. I mean, this is... Well, well I mean, that's, that's, that's new to me. I mean, that's, that's, I'm not familiar with that term. I'm not familiar with that teaching, to be honest. Yeah, it's a little bit strange. Yeah. Anyway, look, thank you. Can I leave that with you? If you want to get back to me, just send me a text as to when you want to speak. I can never speak on a Monday, um, but just just give me notice via, via, via text if you want to speak again. All right. OK, Robert. That's great, okay. Linton. Thank you.